Hello everyone, um, welcome to, day, to today's webinar, um, which is titled Building Blocks, Entry Points for Humanitarians when linking cash and voucher assistance in nascent social protection systems. Um, really glad to have so many of you here today. We've had actually 250 registrants, so we're um, hoping for a few more people to attend. Um, but in the meantime, um, let's get started just by uh, getting a bit of a sense of who's in the room. Um, so we're just going to start with a quick poll, um, which is going to ask you if you identify more as a humanitarian or more as a social protection actor or both, um, just so we can see uh, what kind of dialogue we can expect today. So please, please fill that in. And once you've done that, um, we want to try and make this as interactive as possible, which is always hard with so many people on the line. But um, what we'd like to ask you to do is to share your thoughts in the chat box on um, the following question. What do you think the best value add is of humanitarians in building or strengthening social protection systems? So what role can humanitarians play? This is obviously something that the whole <laughs> uh, webinar today is going to be discussing, but we'd love to hear your opinions too. So. Please, please share those thoughts and we'll go back to them towards the end. Okay, so poll results. Um, interesting, so we have predominantly humanitarians today, which is, which is a different balance than we've had in our previous webinars. And I guess that makes a lot of sense in terms of this really is about, you know, what, what can humanitarians do to better understand social protection systems and build them. Um, but I'm really glad to see that we also have some social protection actors on the line and, and people who identify as both. Um, and that amongst our panelists, we have um, a real mix of expertise as well. So uh, let me start off then by introducing myself um, and the panelists so you get a sense of who, um, who you're going to be hearing from today. So my name is Isabel Pelly, and I'm an independent consultant um, uh, specialised in humanitarian cash and voucher assistance. Um, and for the last few months, I've been working um, on behalf of the Grand Bargain Cash Work Stream on linking social protection and humanitarian cash, together with my colleague Zara Rizvi. And um, we've been, amongst others, um, running this uh, series of webinars on the topic. So I'd now like to introduce Laurent and ask him to just um, turn on his camera and say hi as I introduce him. Um, Laurent is uh, from Haiti. Um, he has worked for the last 12 years on food security, livelihoods, agriculture, economic development. Um, and most recently, he was the coordinator for the um, voucher-based social safety net component of the uh, Corée la Vie social safety net program, which you'll be hearing a lot about um, later today. And he's now uh, working as a food security and Resilience Advisor for Care International, based out of Atlanta. Then uh, we also have uh, Clément Rouquette, who is um, a shock responsive social protection advisor with uh, the World Food Programme in Haiti. Um, and so he's working on uh, the, the development and rollout of the um, social protection policy there. And prior to that, um, Clément was working as the country director for the NGO ACTED in a number of countries, including Libya, South Sudan, Iraq, and Haiti. Thank you, Isabel. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. All. Um, then our next speaker is uh, Sigrid Kulke. Um, Sigrid is the thematic expert for forced displacement, migration, and social protection um, focused on Africa for, for DG ECHO. She has around 20 years experience as a humanitarian expert, primarily in food security and nutrition, working for NGOs, the UN and the World Bank, as well as ECHO. And in recent years, she's really specialized in the links between uh, humanitarian assistance and social protection systems. And last but not least, we have Marion, who will um, be co-presenting with, with Sigrid on Mali. Um, Marion is, works for the EU delegation in Mali as a nutrition and resilience uh, program manager. Um, she's responsible for a 40 million euro resilience program um, focused on social protection um, in central and northern Mali. Um, and prior to that, she's got extensive experience working on uh, humanitarian and development funding in conflict um, and transitional environments. 
So we're really lucky to have such a great bunch of speakers and to be able to have these co-presentations um, on Mali from uh, Sigrid and Marion and on Haiti from Clément and Laurent. So what can we expect today? Um, well, just give firstly um, a little bit of background on, on the webinar series. I mean, many of you will be no doubt familiar with this by now. So just very briefly, um, this series is, is hosted by the Grand Bargain Cash Workstream subgroup on linking social protection and humanitarian cash. Um, and the series is structured around priority topics which um, emerge from a, uh, a knowledge management and learning needs assessment conducted by Zera and myself. And so some topics we've decided to tackle through webinars. This is the third of the series, but actually the series is going to be um, going to run over a period of 12 months. So you can expect one a month for the foreseeable. Um, and also discussion threads where we've been trying to tackle some more um, nascent issues, really, um, and challenging issues um, by getting different opinions through discussions. And we really encourage you to take part in those when you can. Um, We'd love to be able to get more messaging out about this webinar on social media. So you can see um, the hashtags there and uh, Zara can also share them in the chat box for you. So um, what are we trying to achieve with this particular webinar? In fact, we, uh, it really builds off um, where we left off with, with uh, the webinar that we had two weeks ago. For those of you who were there, that webinar was about um, how to link cash and voucher assistance and social protection in uh, context of forced displacement. And a question that came out from quite a few of the audience members was, <clears throat> okay, well, great, but what, what do we do actually where there's hardly any social protection system in place or the social protection system is very fragmented? Um, and that's a great question and that's what we're trying to, to get to today. So really look at what role humanitarian actors have played in designing cash and voucher assistance to link to social protection systems. Um, looking at what, um, what success, successful collaboration looks like between humanitarian actors and the government and other actors, of course, development actors as well, which we'll be hearing a lot about today. Um, and learn from both the successes and challenges of these experiences. So we've really been encouraging our speakers to um, reflect on what hasn't worked as well, because we think that's the best way of learning. Uh, I just want to go back to a framework, which again, those of you who've attended these webinars before will hopefully be getting more familiar with. Um, but the intent with this webinar series is for us to um, zoom in on um, different forms of linkages um, between, between humanitarian assistance and social protection, depending on the maturity of, of the national social protection systems and also the objectives of interventions. And so here you can see in this pink circle that we're focusing on nascent social protection in contexts where the social protection system is either non-existent or is sort of internationally led. Um, and that can be um, to meet a range of objectives. So it could be addressing chronic poverty and meeting basic needs, um, building resilience to stresses and shocks, so through shock responsive social protection, uh, and responding to seasonal and humanitarian crisis needs. Um, and our, our case studies today will really touch on those three objectives. So what are the things you should be looking out for in these case study um, presentations? And what, what are some of the subjects that we might want to discuss afterwards? Um, we've, we've provided a few questions to our speakers to help them, to help guide them through their presentations. Um, firstly, you know, what did you do as a humanitarian to understand what elements of the social protection system were in place and what you could build on? And in doing so, how did you think about um, the political economy um, of the context, particularly given we're talking about relatively fragile contexts? Um, did you have specific tools to do this? Um, organizational tools, inter-organizational tools to assess possible linkages and see um, what the entry points were? How did you and how do you coordinate with the government and others? You know, what forums are in place? What role did you as humanitarians play? Which building blocks of the social protection system did you build and or strengthen? So on the right hand side here, we have a framework, which again, some of you may be getting familiar with, which looks at what we describe as the three building blocks of social protection systems. So policy, 
program and administration um, and our speakers will be touching on how they have linked uh, with each. What have you been able to leave in place? What are those sustainable investments um, that will last beyond the end of um, say a humanitarian intervention but can then be used for humanitarian response in future as well? And then as much as possible, um, reflecting on you know, what, what is the value for money of these investments? When, what kind of time frame can humanitarians expect to see um, a return on those investments? And you know, what, how should we be more realistic perhaps about our expectations um, in that regard? So um, with that uh, introduction in place, I'm now going to hand over to Clément and Laura um, to present um, on, on Haiti and uh, hear from them about the investments they have made and how they see future collaboration between humanitarians and the government. So over to you. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi again. Nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you this morning. Um, so you can go on the next slide, Isabel, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so the first slide of this case study may be to provide you with a, with a bit of context. Um, in a nutshell, Haiti is both exposed to chronic vulnerability with high poverty rate. Uh, you have actually the majority of the population living with less than $2 a day, but also it's regularly facing uh, emergency needs triggered by large shock, could be hurricane, earthquake, but also socioeconomic shocks. Um, however, uh, from my personal experience, what I realized in Haiti is that this distinction between chronic and humanitarian needs does not make, re does not make really sense and it's actually harder and harder to make. That's because I believe, like elsewhere, crises in Haiti are becoming more and more protracted and uh, interlinked between them. It's always a combination of crises, it's not one single crisis. Um, so what, what we can say is that, all in all, humanitarian and social protection objectives are more and more aligned, meaning that as humanitarian, we have to improve and identify synergy and complementarity with a with social protection system. Um, another point I'd like to highlight here maybe is uh, the limited government capacity and the weak institutions. Um, safety nets in Haiti are highly fragmented, underfunded, and suffer from sparse coverage. Um, there was no strategic coordination, uh, no payment platform able to have a national coverage, um, also a lack of centralization of social assistance program, um, and the national budget dedicated to social protection is really low compared to uh, other regional countries. But I hope today that you will see that even in fragile contexts where the level of uh, maturity of the social protection uh, is low, there is a way, there's still a way to maximize the use of social protection system to provide a better response to affected population. Um, so the main objective of this presentation will be to articulate what does it mean to work with nascent social protection system in a fragile context like uh, Haiti. Laura, over to you. Thank you, Clema, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar this morning. Uh, as my colleague Clema said, Haiti is prone to natural disaster. <clears throat> in fact, and as you may know, in 2010, the country was hit by a deadly earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands of people and displaced hundreds of thousands of others. Um, shortly after the earthquake, Hurricane Toma hit Haiti again, especially the southwest part of Haiti and the Goddard's department. So um, one of the major impacts of that natural disaster was food insecurity. So it was really important and urgent to guarantee food security for the crisis affected households. So as humanitarian actor, CARE had to step up, you know, to try and alleviate the suffering of those people. Uh, but the size of the demand was so high, so important. So it was, it was very crucial for CARE to, to put together, to find out the best ways the efficient way to reach out to the victims, not only of the hurricanes, but also of, of the earthquake displaced people. So that's when we 
we had to sit down with um, GCL, which is one of the largest telecommunication company in Haiti. And together, we developed an electronic platform that would allow us to distribute food to the thousand of people that were displaced because of the earthquake and also the victims of the hurricane. And it was a very challenging experience, but it was a very good experience. And that experience was going to be transformed into a longer term social safety net model that was going to be led by the government of Haiti. There came the Koilavi program. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you. Now, we transition from humanitarian assistance to a longer term government led social safety net. So, we talk about Koelavi. Now, what did we do differently? So, first of all, it's important to note that Koelavi, the goal of Koelavi was mainly to reduce food and security and vulnerability by supporting the government of Haiti in establishing a replicable safety net system and also expanding capacities to prevent child malnutrition. So in that program, we had four components. The first component dealt with vulnerability targeting, which led to the CMAS, which my colleague Clema will, will talk about um, shortly. We also developed and piloted a voucher-based social safety net that was gender sensitive. We also um, work with preventing malnutrition among the pregnant and lactating women and also among children under two years old. But most importantly, via the, the fourth component of the COILA program, we made sure that the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor and other key government institutions acquired the necessary capacities to be able to take over and scale up the social safety net model. So now let's see what we achieved as part of the COELAVI program. Um, first of all, like I said, we developed the, the social safety net model and we tested it. We enrolled more than 18,000. Oh, can you go back, please? Can you go back a slide? Okay, thank you. Yes, we developed the social safety net model. And from that, we also build you know, social cohesion uh, uh, among the local communities. We, we did women empowerment through the SLAs, which are the village saving and loan associations. We build stronger market systems. We boost local um, production. And most importantly, the system was used to address you know, the situation of the victims of Hurricane Matthew. In October 2016, Hurricane Matthew hit Haiti and caused a lot of um, problems, and we used the safety net you know, to support the victims. Now, how have we done that? First of all, we identified the best modalities and approaches to, to make the social safety net more efficient. We foster the use of innovative approach via technology, because as I said, we develop an, an electronic platform, and through that platform, we are able to reach out to those people on a timely fashion. We also build local capacity. We work with the local institutions, we work with the community-based organizations. We put together a network of community agents who received proper training. And right now, if you go back to Haiti, you will have a, a pool 
of community agents that are able to um, work in any social protection endeavor. So that was because of Coelavi. We also partnered with local market actors, like we partnered with um, local MFIs, microfinance institutions. We put together a network of um, local vendors to facilitate the virtual exchange. So we did, we did all that as part of the Coelavi program. But it was important to note also with who we have worked to achieve all that. Um, obviously, we work with the government of Haiti. We work with the private sector, GCEL. We work with um, the community-based organizations, but we also work with other NGO partners like WFP, World Vision, Action Against Hunger, you know, so that we could provide um, a better service quality to the most vulnerable. Next. Again, as you know, we, we registered some successes, but we also registered some challenges as part of that social safety net. Um, the, the, the model that was developed at part of the COELAVI program allowed security and easy tracking. That means um, the beneficiaries received and spend the money without actually touching the money because it was like in kind distribution. And we set up a network of vendors approximately of the, of the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries did have to walk long distance to be able to exchange their vouchers and receive the goods. Also, it allowed efficiency as we bypassed operational burden and we embrace more competitive administration program costs. Um, we noted also that um, as success, as benefit, that the electronic vouchers can play a very significant role in assisting, in assisting vulnerable households from the very remote areas. So um, um, as part of the Coelavi program, we worked with people that live in the very remote areas where you have no service whatsoever. Also, um, we managed to, to build the interest of the Haitian government and the model. And I think we will be talking about that. We, um, um, the Haitian government right now, as part of the elaboration of the social um, um, protection policy, they will use that model to build on that, you know, and incorporate it into the, the policy. So as drawbacks or challenges, um, since we're working in the very remote areas of Haiti, sometimes we have lack of stable mobile network coverage. And also, we have so many people that cannot read or write and that basically limited the full application of the technology. And um, when you're doing electronic vouchers, um, the registration of the beneficiary takes time. And um, at the beginning, we underestimated, you know, the time that it would take to register those beneficiaries. So that, that was um, a challenge for us. And last but not least, it was um, an vision that the government of Haiti would take over the social safety net and scale it up using their own budget. But unfortunately, you know, lack of funding, you know, prevented the, the, the government from doing so. So with that, um, I will head it over to, to Clement to continue the other aspects. Thank you, Laura, for this um, great overview of, of Coelavis. That really was a game changer in, in the social protection agenda in, uh, in Haiti. Um, if you may, I'm going to elaborate a bit more on the institutionalization component. Um, 
just to say maybe that one of the key activity to, to strengthen social protection system uh, is obviously capacity building for governmental institutions. Um, in Haiti, we've been designing a comprehensive tool to assess institutional capacity, looking at seven, seven criteria related to human resources, uh, administrative capacity, technical capacity, uh, but as well with uh, material resources. So this assessment that we call diagnostic uh, allows for specific action plan to improve institutional capacity. Uh, so just to give you a few examples, we've been providing material support, but also training more than uh, 50 civil servants from the Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, we also facilitated exchange visit, uh, where high level of uh, high level delegation of IT went to Ethiopia, uh, which was quite appreciated by the participants actually. Uh, so south south cooperation uh, could be an option as well. Um, this overall approach of uh, institutionalization was quite effective to improve the mass capacity to manage a safety net. Since uh, you can see on the graph here, uh, we went from zero to 3.2. Uh, in about three years, which is quite uh, impressive. Um, just maybe to highlight a couple of challenges here. Um, first of all, some aspects are more difficult to tackle. Uh, we're speaking about HR policy of the governments, uh, where the control on our side is a bit low. Um, and as Laura said, we don't control the government budget allocation. So that was the limit of the approach. Next slide, please. Uh, so Laura briefly evoked the, the CMAST, um, which is another key feature of the, of the Corella V. Uh, it's the uh, system information, information system of the Ministry of Social Affairs, um, which is interesting here that it started as a targeting tool for the, for the Corella V program, but is now a multifunctional system uh, used by many NGOs actually uh, to deliver cash and voucher assistance. So it helps them to target the beneficiaries. Uh, as of now, uh, the CMAS the contains vulnerability data on about 500 households in Haiti, which is more or less 25% of the population. Uh, you can see here on the right of the slide uh, the 21 indicators to calculate the vulnerability index for the given household. Um, I mean, we all know that uh, poverty is relative, um, but this specific tool um, allows us to have a common understanding between the government and its partner of how we measure multidimensional poverty in the country. Um, and I'll come back to that later, but the CMAS now has the potential to be a social registry uh, for, the, uh, for the policy. Next. Uh, so yeah, just talk about the, the policy. Indeed, we've been working now since three years on developing a national social protection and, and promotion policy with, with the government. Um, and Covera was key actually to position WFP uh, and CARE as a main partner for the, for the government for social protection. Um, as such, we've been supporting the ministry in the policy process. Uh, first, by simply facilitating the dialogue between key stakeholders. Uh, so we're talking about donors, ministry, civil society, private sector, other UN agencies, and they all were in the drafting committee that was appointed in, in 2017. Secondly, um, beyond this, this process component, we've been working directly on the content of the policy, uh, and this policy is now about to be handed over to the, to the presidential, pre presidential office. Sorry. Um, maybe what is important to say here is that linking social protection with humanitarian takes time. You can see the timeline here. Um, it does not really look like a humanitarian timeline. It's like a five or six years timeline. Uh, so it was really a lengthy process to, uh, to reach this common programmatic framework between the, between the government and its partner uh, with, uh, with its social protection policy. Next slide. So here you can see the, uh, the four strategic axes of the policy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Um, but you can see in the four strategic axes that the social transfer, uh, equivalent but not exactly the same than, uh, than cash and voucher assistance, play an important role uh, to reach the objective of the policy. Um, so I believe this document has the potential to provide a, a common programmatic framework between the government and its partner, uh, especially when it comes to uh, social transfer and, uh, and cash and voucher assistance. Um, maybe interesting for, for you, minutes, sorry. Which is mainly maybe interesting for for humanitarian practitioner is the last axis of the policy, uh, which is related to shock responsive. Um, 
Um, and these documents provide guidelines on, uh, on mechanisms to be used during a slow or rapid onset emergency, but also identify coordination mechanisms between humanitarian partners uh, heavily involved in the, uh, in the emergency response, but as well uh, with the government. Because we all know that social protection could be an interesting tool to respond to emergency, but it won't be able, especially in Haiti, to respond to 100% of the needs. Uh, thus, we need the coordination between humanitarian, development, and social protection actors. Um, last slide uh, in terms of uh, Haiti uh, case study. Um, I'm going maybe to sound a bit provocative here, uh, but really we need a new approach to humanitarian crisis. Um, we can simply uh, have a three-month program on cash and voucher assistance and go away. That's not anymore an option. Um, so working through the social protection system should be the, the norm, I guess. Uh, and if it's not possible, we should explain why. Also, uh, when there are no system, like in Haiti, you, uh, I hope you realize that the system was really low. Um, there shouldn't be an excuse for, for doing a separate response. We need to invest on in building the system with our, with our counterpart from the states. Um, also, maybe to emphasize here the role of donors, um, and maybe new donors to humanitarian, so we're speaking about the World Bank and, and the IMF. Uh, in IT, they've been involved in this uh, discussion. Um, and to give you a concrete example, um, the next loan of the IMF to the, government of, to the government of Haiti is conditional to the endorsement of the, of the policy, which protects somehow the process from, uh, from political turmoil that we've been through in, uh, in Haiti. Uh, that's all from my side. I don't know, Laura, if you have some recommendation to add. Um, thank you, Clema. I think you said uh, everything basically. I just wanted to add that the CMAS to the system information of, of the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor is one of the uh, um, most important aspects that was handed over to the Haitian government. And right now, for the first time, uh, I'm Haitian, I'm talking from experience. For the first time, you know, uh, um, the government of Haiti, you know, detains a dynamic database that other NGOs can use, you know, to um, 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 build or uh, put together their social um, safety net programs. You know, they, before it was, you know, everyone, came with their own methodology, their own strategy and everything. But right now, we have a combined um, um, strategy like to, to move forward. And I think that, that's, very, that's very important. And the Haitian government and the other NGO partners understood the need to elaborate you know, a national policy on social protection. You know, and that way, we can um, regulate things and have a standard way of doing doing things for the benefit of the, of the most um, vulnerables. And again, as a recommendation, um, when we work in, you know, with the local communities, it is really important to involve the community leaders and the local institutions. So instead of um, building new structures it is more important to reinforce the capacity of the existing ones, you know, build on that, you know, and then to improve the living conditions of the most vulnerable. So, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Clément. That was a really uh, clear presentation of how uh, la Vie as a social safety net and its components like CMAST um, have paved the way for greater institutionalization um, within the government and then the development of the social protection policy. And Tim, I really like your, your provocation to, to, you know, challenging us to, um, to think about doing business differently and who we need to collaborate with for that. Um, so we're now going to transition to Mali and Mali are in a way a few years ahead in this process of trying to link humanitarian assistance with social protection systems um, in a highly complex environment um, and where over the last few years there have been some, some setbacks associated with conflict in particular. Um, so we'll be he hearing from um, Sigrid and Marion about what is realistic to achieve um, as humanitarians, what lessons can be learned for, uh, for us all in the audience and perhaps for Haiti too. So uh, over to you, um, Sigrid. 
Hello, nice to talk to you. Here it's already the afternoon, end of the afternoon here in Nairobi. Um, so I would actually um, really like to start provoking actually as well, uh, saying that uh, in, in the case study we are going to talk about now, um, it's not, the issue is not around uh, uh, trying to use the national system to, for humanitarian response. We are far away from that actually. So our ambition is a is maybe lower, but actually it's also higher because uh, I, my 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 stance is that um, what we can do is contribute to building something, building something, uh, laying foundations of a future system and, and a, few, a system that is really inclusive, uh, covering all the population that is in need and. Um, yeah, also, also um, respect, uh, respecting certain principles. So let's look into that. Um, I would also like mention right away that, uh, first of all, that there has been a lot of studies actually um, of the past uh, five years on Mali. Uh, it doesn't mean we are very advanced, but it, it was like uh, this context that always, or everybody was interested in. Um, so especially from, from Ecoside, you can see EU ECHO is appearing three times among the five studies, but there was also one that uh, is uh, under DFID funding, uh, no two actually, because the initial one was both um, ECHO and DFID, and the last one, um, uh, and then the additional one in the beginning as well uh, by CULP. So always there was this question about how actually contribute to building something, tweaking the national system, building uh, laying foundations in a in a complex environment that is actually um, we can go uh, to the next slide uh, a very complex context where uh, as 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 we usually call it it's a covariate um, it's covariate shocks where you actually traditionally had a regular food crisis uh, since the 80s um, so you see. Uh, uh, mostly in the north, the attention of the development donors uh, were there together with the government. Uh, and then since uh, to, uh, 2012, there was also the coup d'etat and adding um, a layer of, 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 of conflict. Uh, the fragility of the state, uh, we also know about the government's issues and also what humanitarian actors raised as a big concern since the last food crisis 2005 is actually the nutrition, malnutrition, uh, permanent uh, structurally high uh, acute malnutrition in the country and of course as well chronic malnutrition. So it's a combination of many, many crises. I didn't mention the, the sudden onset that as well you have uh, floods, you have epidemics, uh, uh, measles regularly. So we have everything we want <laughs> as challenges. And this translates overall in, in very bad um, human and humanitarian indicators. So when we look in this, in, in, in this quite challenging context, uh, where social protection actually comes from, um, this is not less challenging because uh, actually Mali, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the initial crisis was the food crisis. Uh, so in the 80s um, and 90s, the development donors with the government started to to look into uh, a regular um, food food response uh, or um, government-led food response. Uh, so actually, um, this is important to know because this is like uh, more development donors. There was no um, custom or uh, there was no habit actually to 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 uh, to to be able to work in a in a conflict environment which needs uh, other capacities on top of um, responding to food crisis and um, natural hazards. Uh, the second aspect also uh, to know um, when you look at the, the, you can show the, the blocks actually where the uh, piece, um, where the social protection is very fragmented. And the second component is actually that um, uh, social protection came rather from a health entry point. So, and it was not non-contributory. 
uh, so the health ministry is not even here in the scheme because it would have been too big. Uh, you can only see the one with early warning system that I mentioned uh, linked to food crisis is the right wing, <laughs> right wing, sorry. Uh, and the health ministry then uh, was in charge actually uh, together with the social affairs ministry to provide um, the contributory, to build the contributory um, uh, medical contributory system. So, so there was not a habit to provide uh, for free cash of, of food beyond uh, the food crisis. And then in, in, uh, from 2013 onwards, uh, World Bank actually uh, also appeared in the country. And um, of course, they look at risks uh, in the country, financial risks, so their option for, for supporting the government with uh, direct cash transfers. Um, the Jiggy CMRG program was put actually into the, the program implementation unit was put into another ministry, uh, the finance, finance ministry. Uh, so you see it's, it's really, uh, the, the key message for me is, is really to see initially you have to take uh, really this time uh, to identify where, where is the social protection uh, spread across, who are the main actors, and of course, in terms of governance, governance to understand which, which, uh, in, especially in a weak um, state, the the governments goes rather vertical towards the donor. So the Ministry of Finance, which is is not going to report primarily to the Prime Minister, but maybe rather to the donor, uh, to World Bank, and the same maybe for for CSR, if uh, to the main uh, donor in terms of uh, budget support. So the, this is uh, very important to understand. Um, that's also, I mean, maybe the, the key message from here as well, the takeaway is you have to proceed like uh, in, a, in, a, in an advocacy, um, when you build an advocacy plan and strategy, usually you map the actors. Uh, if you have allies or blockers and to understand actually uh, why, uh, who are they or, or the different um, stakeholders and what is their interest and can you find, can you find a common uh, space. Okay, uh, let's now look what actually was invested by the humanitarian actors uh, since the, the, the conflict. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so now we see on the left again uh, the, the scheme that was presented by Isabel in the beginning. Uh, the social protection system building blocks with the three groups. One is the rather policy environment, um, institutional environment, then more the program design, what you give to, to the population and then how you give it, that's the last block, the delivery system, the administration. So let's look uh, first of all on, on the more um, policy environment um, as, as, as first. What is interesting that usually this, uh, this block, uh, it's, it's kind of, you say, no, humanitarians, they don't have an entry point there. But yes, they can have. And uh, I put it actually in green because I think when you look back uh, since, the, uh, since uh, 2013, when really the support started uh, quite uh, strongly from humanitarian side as well, um, that uh, yes, there was a lot of emphasis put into it. So of course, funding, uh, the humanitarians did not opt for putting the money into a government channel. There was, I mean, there was no question even about it, no discussion. There was, um, I mean, there was no system in place. Uh, World Bank came later, it was not at scale. It didn't coincide with the priority area. So in terms of geography, uh, there was no um, convergency. But what the humanitarian actors did a lot investment on is on logistics, training, and also staffing. So, um, for example, logistics in, in conflict areas, uh, a little bit farmer, where there was still technical uh, um, stuff from the technical state departments present. Uh, there was, for example, the possibility to offer them to go to the field with humanitarians uh, in terms of kind of coaching on the job training <laughs> to see how actually you can do targeting, how can be done monitoring. And this also was limited. The, this was restricted to areas where um, the government was not seen as part of the conflict uh, in this conflict where, of course, the state is part of the conflict. So you have, again, uh, really to do a 
quite um, very fine analysis and on where you can do what with the state. So in some areas, this is absolutely a no-go uh, because in, in terms of humanitarian principles, which are, at co um, of course, at, at the core of our mandate, uh, we want to protect the population and, if, um, and of course, our teams as well in the, in, in the field. And we don't want to put them at risk uh, by being associated with the government. Um, okay, so maybe not to take too long on this, so there was um, a lot of investment initially. What also needs to be said, uh, uh, actually in terms of legal um, policy framework, there was almost nothing in place specifically to say social protection. Um, so there was also, this was a window of opportunity to also uh, feed into this work, which is usually um, led by um, development actors. So um, there was the elaboration of the national policy, the action plan, there was also guidelines of food distribution that uh, to include also cash in there and some minimum standards on monitoring, uh, the national response plan, the poli uh, national policy on social, uh, social uh, on food security to include the social protection component. So there was a lot of, um, of uh, on this work done. Um, what uh, and what was also important to make this happen is is uh, this this work actually um, was kicked off through the coordination mechanisms. There was actually an ongoing dialogue that uh, allowed humanitarians and development actors to be somehow in touch, uh, not perfectly, but uh, there was actually both technical and strategic level where both humanitarian and development actors would meet. Uh, so you have the cash working group on the technical level, where also the PIU from the, the World Bank funded uh, program Jiggy Semiri attended and government um, from social affairs ministry. And then on the other side, um, there was put a, a social protection donor working group in place, which was actually not only humanitarian uh, development, but also donors, but also actually open to cash working group uh, representative and, uh, and UN, UN. So this this communication actually allowed us as well to see, ah, there's somebody supporting the government on this policy. Can we not have a say in this or contribution? So uh, I think this was a key level uh, or a key takeaway to say, you have to have open communication channels, otherwise you cannot um, work on any nexus because it's usually very siloed where the humanitarian world is working and the government with support of development donors. Um, yes, on the next uh, pillow, program design, so what to um, to give to uh, to beneficiaries to, and who, who to target. Um, there was actually, I put it again, dark green, there was heavy investment. Um, to have dialogue both with the early warning system on, on have standards uh, for targeting and also um, how much to give, for how long, how many times, all these classical questions. And the same also with World Bank. And we can, uh, yeah, World Bank GGSMRG to see what is the coverage, especially in, in, in a given area how to roll out to the conflict areas, uh, conflict affected areas in the north, what minimum standards to, to, to work on, what amount to, to transfer. And then what is important, this is the last um, component of subcomponent of, of the program design is the additional services. Uh, and what humanitarian actors were very keen on is to actually have this holistic approach to social protection, not to go beyond cash and also have, um, for example, during a distribution, then the, the um, screening of, of uh, nutritional screening, and then uh, in case of um, detection of, of malnourished children and um, women, then to refer them to a health center. And this is complicated, again, to set it really up because uh, it's across different ministries and the links are very complicated to build. But there was this, this very, very, uh, there was a quite a lot of dialogue with the government put on this and uh, uh, sharing of best practices, what, what has been working on the human chain side and to, to see how this can also be taken uh, over by both early warning system and the permanent uh, safety net GGSMGRI. Okay, then the last big investment, I will, this will be shorter, it's on, it's the third block on delivery systems, how to actually channel the 
uh, support to um, to the population um, what is maybe the most important uh, issue um, is the um, social registry so there was quite an enthusiasm in 2013-14 to say okay um, let's let's build something that is um, that can be used for for humanitarians as well that will avoid us to tar retarget every year so if we have a national database of course um, respecting the, the protocol in terms of um, protection uh, uh, protection issues um, then it will really save us time and quality and uh, decrease the exclusion error and and uh, have better quality work and this was a huge work um, this uh, we should not forget so there was also on within this framework uh, work on the unified common questionnaire uh, so there was a technical committee set up um, under the Ministry of Social Affairs where which also included actually humanitarians which was uh, a great opportunity uh, what I also put, I just mentioned, I already mentioned as one key issue is the, the protection. And this is really something new to, to Mali, again, because uh, the conflict uh, context was quite recent and people wouldn't automatically think of what it actually means to collect data from people and can you do it in, in such an environment. What I did not mention right away, which is the lighter green, is the technical exchange platform. The, the cash working group where actually the technical standards, um, technical questions were discussed about payment, uh, case management, M&E, accountability. Uh, so this was uh, on, on the more uh, the administration side as well. Thank you. Um, I pass now the word over to my colleague from Mali. Mario. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, well, um, so as you, you've seen, uh, there has been a tremendous investment in social protection a few years ago in order to build integrated and shock responsive systems. Yet, after five years, what's left on the ground? Uh, and assuming that the conflict did not stop and uh, kept going on. As you can see, first of all, in the colors uh, that are going to be used, that all the green that you've seen before has disappeared and is now yellow, orange, or red, showing a real slowdown or even stagnation. And so in the first block, as you can see, uh, regarding the institutional environment, yes, we have to say that uh, Mali advanced quite a lot on elaboration of policy documents a few years ago. Uh, so we've got policies, we've got multiple year action plans, and even renewed, but their application is not done properly yet. Um, then co the coordination groups. So yes, we do have coordination groups who do exist, but uh, uh, either on a technical or uh, strategical level, but they are not that much official or um, maybe sometimes often on a slowdown base, uh, on the slowdown mode. So they are not working either properly. Then, so the humanitarian interventions are clearly parallel and separate to national interventions. Um, yes, in order also to respect humanitarian principle of independence. Yes, but uh, it, uh, a, key, a key progress happened uh, since in 2016-2017, part of humanitarian cash and voucher assistance uh, was taken over by development donor. So it provides. Um, long-term trending for NGOs, humanitarian NGOs still. But so things have not changed that much, but it's on progress. And concerning resources, uh, it's sad to say that the financial contribution by the government is weakening more and more. And this leaves more and more gaps, which can only be partially filled by international actors also giving that uh, we are, uh, I mean, like humanitarian funding are also decreasing for the Mali crisis. Then on the second block, uh, Isabel, if you could move on. Thank you. Uh, regarding the program design, uh, we are still facing various challenges. The challenges, uh, I mean, like related, uh, we have 
various interventions, project-based, diff with different eligibility criteria, conditions, transfer type or duration, with a limited connection between them. So we don't have a system working. We've got different interventions together, but not working uh, in a connected manner. So, and the technical discussion have not resulted in adoption of common technical standards. And government agency in charge of safety net could really have a stronger role in that. Then the early warning system, the SAP system, uh, has integrated the ATA approach, including an early warning system component, which is part of the regional IPC. So there is an improvement and also on the side there is a strong separate rapid response mechanism uh, tackling I mean like the rapid onset shocks and sport displacement. So it's the system itself is not still shock responsive, it's the humanitarian assistance that's making it shock responsive. Um, and so the, the, I mean, like, regarding additional services, there has been a little improvement, especially on nutrition, which is, it, um, and nutrition is progressively associated with uh, social protection and cash transfer programs. Um, our UTF, so the nutrition uh, treatment, uh, are now part of the national essential drug and is more and more taken into consideration. So it's a little improvement. And then, Yet, regarding health, the free health care linked with the social protection is still not, I mean, which is called RAMAD, is still not almost effective yet. So there has been improvement, but yes, still a stagnation. And if we have a look at the third block, you see the color is still, still pretty much yellow and, yellow and orange. And regarding the, the, the delivery mechanism, I mean, like, we had improvements, but not that much. We have a unified questionnaire for harmonized collection data, which has been approved in 2017. And we've got a unified registry, uh, but yet the, the data proce uh, process is still very heavy and costly, and it's not sure that humanitarian will keep going on feeding the, feeding the system at its is so, I mean, like so heavy to carry. Um, the registry is also not a national registry. I mean, like it's only updated uh, from time to time by the humanitarian interventions and the national interventions. So, uh, I mean, like humanitarians still require to do new targeting every year. And payment methods, sorry. Yes, and payment methods uh, of the national program are still not flexible enough. As said uh, also uh, Sigrid before, data protection is, is a challenge now. And uh, because uh, there are still uncertainties concerning the effectiveness of the data protection protocol, which is actually going on. So to wrap up, things have moved, but very, uh, very, very small. Uh, with a very small part, it's still uh, there is still a huge work to do to improve and to go to reach to a common common technical standards, long term financial commitment to put uh, I mean like together uh, working on a system working including in shock, shock response. We are still far from it, very far from it. So please next uh, slide, please. But do we have, uh, I mean, like, do we, do we have the possibility to find a shared space between development actors and uh, humanitarian actors? I mean, uh, creating or uh, protecting this social protection system? I would say yes. Uh, Mali is not officially part of the EU Nexus pilot initiative. But yet, the context was adapted to, to think about it. And uh, as I said clearly before, we are in a protected crisis. We uh, have no separate lines between humanitarian needs and long-term needs. It doesn't make that much sense. And so uh, there's no linearity from humanitarian assistance to development interventions. They have to be sometimes together 
because we can see in Mali that some in some some areas several areas are becoming unstable and some unstable areas are finally getting a bit more stability. So we have to think about having um, two set system working at the same time. And uh, uh, in I mean like and in this kind of context, uh, we have to push humanitarian actors to engage more and more, not only with humanitarian donors, but also with development donors. It's uh, difficult and it's also very time consuming, but it's the only way to, to be able to work on. And um, to be able to build this common, uh, this shared area, shared space, I mean, like it's important to come on to consider to preserve the previous investment whereas the investment has been done by humanitarian actors or development actors so there is something to build on or to be able to to get into but we have to not to break what has been done before but to, to continue to build on it and it's possible while respecting the humanitarian principle it's it's really possible a little bit working in Mali. And important thing is that we have to focus on a, a joint or common sectorial anal analysis. It's sometimes difficult to find those common an and shared analysis between development actors and humanitarian actors, but without them, it's difficult to build something. So it has to go on. And it's difficult also for development actors, but we have to be flexible in such kind of context. And we have to think out of the box on how can we, on, on the modalities, on the day-to-day day -day modalities. And so uh, we have to be realistic, we have to be adapt, uh, adaptive, and to conclude, I mean, like, we have to be pragmatic. And it's not always easy to do so when uh, we have to, to think about uh, interventions regarding also, I mean, like, uh, taking care that the humanitarian principles are respected. Uh, thank you very much, and I give the give the line back to to Sigrid for the next uh, for the next slide. Okay, to make a, a quick wrap up, um, let's already move to the next slide and go to the nice turtles. Exactly. <laughs> so the. Uh, we suggest actually four four main steps. So the four, first one is 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 really as as a wrap up to to first in a conflict setting to focus on the humanitarian intervention first to really work on what can we do in terms of um, transferring minimum services to more, the population most in need and how can we do that uh, really having access to the most um, hard to reach areas under control of the rebels or the, or the government any population we have to get this access and this is difficult to uh, enough and this has to be secured and i think this step we should not we should never forget it first and we have all these principles which um, of course conflict sensitivity protection people centered this is 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 not a joke <laughs> as everybody knows second step then uh, this can also start, of course, with the first step together to see, okay, usually we use the word cat herding, and now I propose the word turtle herding to see what actually among all the humanitarian actors um, intervening in, in, in a complex setting, how can we become um, stronger by creating alliances? And this is very co complicated because, of course, um, there's compromises to do, but it gives you a voice in terms of um, dialogue with government and World Bank. To this respect, I would really uh, again cite an um, example from Mali where actually World Bank kind of noticed there's something like ECHO, which I didn't know it existed, when they were told there was uh, an organization called ECHO uh, funding um, cash transfers already in Mali for 40,000 households. And doing a census, including 120,000 households, which is almost 1 million population. And they were like, what is this? So sometimes you have to be also pragmatic, very strategically saying, okay, we have to align to actually have something to say on national level as an NGO, especially. Um, 
of course, this is not only this thinking, but also there's technical aspects uh, which are, uh, which of course the, you can better build on uh, if you get together and maybe invest in uh, specialized human resources. There's many other uh, interests in building on alliances. And the next important step, the third one, is once you have uh, worked on this humanitarian side, which of course the third one you can start before, is to look who else is, is out there. And this is really what I mentioned in the beginning, a key step, this, this um, initial analysis where you try to understand who are the people out there, the organizations, what do they want, where do we come from, and really do this, this political economy stakeholder analysis very thoroughly. And what we noticed in Mali is, of course, uh, social protection cannot only go um, you cannot only talk only with the government, as uh, shown in the small uh, scheme before, what Marion showed, is you also have to talk with other donors, uh, internationally funded NGOs working on development, for example. So it's, it's not only a government issue, because uh, maybe the investment cannot come from the government, because of course if there's a war they have other interests, but maybe some development donors can uh, be willing to invest in, in, in this space, due to also to uh, international commitments. Um, what also was very important that it's not even only donors or government, there's also if you're in a conflict area, you have also other area, other actors which you should not be neglecting. They can also, I mean, be uh, you can share some responsibility with them. For example, if you talk about basic social service delivery, distributed cash, I mean, they have an interest also that the population gets something, maybe for other interests, not for maybe altruistic ones. But yes, they can. You you can, uh, as, as was done in Mali, uh, with more or less successes. You can say, okay, humanitarians, we got, we're going to stop the intervention if if the attacks stop, they don't stop. So you can also uh, put in place a strike uh, if the local actors don't uh, share more responsibility for the local with uh, you for the local population. But this needs a thorough understanding what's going on. And then the last one, the last step is, is then to, to move up to the fourth level, is to move um, on national level and, and be, be sure, uh, based on this, inter uh, this, uh, this mapping of common interest, uh, then you can gather around maybe a topic, a, a thematic that, uh, that you can work on even with government, even with whatever local actors. For example, I would say now in Mali since 2019, uh, the government has declared out of the blue that now um, you, um, health will, should be free for under fives. So maybe it's just a declaration, but maybe it's an opportunity. So you have also to, to understand uh, what is the interest on the other side, not just produce any M&E data and then throw it out. No, maybe produce then data according to this uh, political window of opportunity and shape your messages according to, to this interest. Um, yeah, and uh, what is important in, in advocacy, of course, I mean, uh, as, as an NGO for especially, uh, and you and you, within the humanitarian field, you have to really be, build alliances that get, that go beyond maybe the, maybe you have to include also humanitarian donors because you have access to different information channels and humanitarian donors have to ch uh, partner with uh, development donors or with World Bank to have also more insights into the system. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sigrid, um, for ending with that very helpful roadmap for, for humanitarians and reminding us of starting amongst each other to, to, to build strong alliances as a basis. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Um, you would, just a couple of highlights for me is that you know, both from both contexts, you've highlighted um, the opportunity of seizing, seizing windows to, to be able to align with different um, building blocks of social protection system and in each case you have shown how it's possible to align with policy program and administration um, but I think the the Mali case study has also provided us with a very helpful reality check on um, the time that these um, investments take um, the setbacks uh, related to, to conflict in particular um, and the um, the importance of coordination um, in a context of fragmentation and complexity um, so, with that being said, we have some great questions uh, coming through from the audience. So, um, please could all the panelists turn their, uh, photo, their cameras on 
Um, and we're going to start with a sort of combination of questions from from a, a number of you. So um, there was a question from uh, questions from Marriott and Nupur, um, which were about the exit strategies. Um, what efforts have been made on um, capacity building? training and learning for example or in terms of channeling so that that's an example of, of an exit strategy or channeling funds through the government or supporting the government to generate resources for implementing and managing the program in the future that was specifically oriented at haiti so if we get um if we can have either clement or Hor take the lead on that please just one of you ideally um and then there was a similar question um from uh, Larissa, um, and she was Larissa was asking across these two programs, how much were these programs driven and funded by donors, and how much by the government themselves? Um, so, let's start with Haiti, and then we'll hand over to Mali. I think maybe the the exit strategy question is not quite the same for Mali, but the one on the extent to which the government was driving these programs is is important. So, yeah, Haiti, please. Okay, uh, I can quickly respond to to the first one. Uh, Laura, please add uh, if, if you think you, you want to. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm going to, uh, to respond on the funding part. Um, just to say that there is a dedicated chapter on the policy on uh, how to fund it, actually. Uh, and how did we do it? Um, so the drafting committee, with a, which is a coordination platform in charge of writing this policy, uh, has commissioned a report from a Haitian economist to find internal resources to fund the policy. Um, so we're talking about rationalizing expenditures of the state. Uh, to give you an example, the, the end of the um, energy subsidies could free up some resources for social protection program, uh, but also to raise taxes. Uh, the fiscal pressure in Haiti is relatively low uh, compared to, to other countries. Um, but let's face it, uh, we are also aware that the support of international committee uh, is essential to deploy the policy. Um, so the World Bank, the IMF, uh, will be strongly involved, at least in the short term, to, to fund this policy. Um, in terms of government uh, reinforcement, it's also a key point of the, the, the policy. Uh, and we, as WFP, uh, are trying to streamline uh, our approach uh, in all our social protection program or project, uh, especially at local level. We try to, to build the capacity of the local government, of the local institution, um, to, to, to do that. I think that's uh, my response for this. I don't know, Laura, if you if you want to add. I think if we can just go on to just in the interest of time, if we can go on to some reflections from okay. uh, from Mali, um, and then Laura can can answer a later question. Okay. Uh, so regarding Mali. I would say that uh, either exit strategies or uh, fundings, uh, national fundings, are a real challenge. And regarding exit, exit strategy, I would say that at the moment they are clearly not on. I mean, I, and I mean, like because the system is not functioning properly. And uh, well, when are the humanitarian going to leave the system? I would say when a working system will be able to take over. But it's not the case at the moment. And also, if there is available resources, because at the moment, the, the, the very big Marion, can you perhaps yeah. turn your video off? Because we can't, the connection is not very good. OK. And so regarding the, the, the funding, it's a challenge with, uh, with the conflict. Uh, there are enormous constraints on the national budget, and it's very, very difficult to have them on. Yeah. If Sigrid, you want to add something? Actually, yes, I go in the same direction that um, in Mali, the stake is rather to, at least as Clément said also in the beginning, um, we cannot just go there in a fragmented way as humanitarians, do a three months cash transfer and leave. So there has been this heavy investment, for example, sitting two days in a row in a social protection policy elaboration committee and this in regular uh, uh, all over again, or the technical committee for the social region. And there's a huge investment that you do and you have to do it. 
maybe the the return on investment you will see it only 20 years later but yes there is an international commitment to social protection and we have the obligation to do so 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 uh, at the moment no exit strategy really um, to see at the moment, uh, we already mentioned that yes no there is strategy really goes on with the development act uh, donors and uh, so this is one thing and yeah it's it's really about piloting a model a prototype that can one day uh, be taken over um and having a close dialogue with the uh, with world bank who's actually the in the driving seat behind the government on on safety nets and um what we can mention actually yes there's interest from national on national level on the health so there was an initiative 2010 on uh, the RAMED to also have some user fee exemption within the national uh, health insurance system, but uh, it was very tiny, um, tinily targeted. So there is also maybe some potential to, at one point, to link the humanitarian health um, health interventions to that, but it's still uh, very complicated if, if, if it doesn't move from government side. And there was also a, a safety net division created within the Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, so there's, they have actually recognized that, yes, it is important to have like a permanent distribution for poorest. But uh, we also have to say, I mean, Mali is not traditionally a poor country. So it's a very also in terms of shame to say, yes, we have poor population. There's differences. There's rich and poor is a very, it was really a taboo topic. So not easy to have buy-in on this. Um, Sigrid, whilst I have you on the line, um, there's um, two questions um, from Elizabeth and Glenn, which uh, have a similar gist. Um, this is around the, uh, the provision of social protection in a conflict setting, when the government is a party to the conflict, um, and especially when there's no access to social protection by the vulnerable in the opposition areas. So um, can you just briefly let us know how that's working in Mali and thoughts from any other contexts um, that you might have as well? Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely definitely very complicated to to work with the government in such a setting. And um, for example, in the center of Mali, at one point um, since 2015, the security situation was really becoming worse and worse. A new crisis um, uh, appearing, and actually threats to education stuff from the government. So they actually left the area and closed uh, the schools. So in such a setting, what you can do in this area is no, you will not have any uh, collaboration with the national, um, the the government uh, departments, because then you would put a threat to 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 uh, to the population and to your teams. Uh, so the really then we come back to the step one I show, showed in the turtle graph. You have to work on the humanitarian implementation in the field only, but you can at least then feedback to the national level, the best practices, the challenges, and the elements that at least can be taken over for the future. So you have to really have this area-based approach where you can do some things in some areas, in others not, and adapt it constantly uh, in, in, in line with, uh, in accordance with the context changes. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, just in the interest of getting all our panelists to respond to, to questions, um, Loha, I'm going to target this one at you. This is um, a question also from uh, from Larissa on, sorry, I just need to scroll back and find it. Um, how much was civil society engaged and consulted in these processes? At which point in the process and going forward, uh, e.g. through um, accountability processes? Um, and to what extent do you think this engagement was genuine? Um, and what, what might you do differently in future? So over to you, Laha. Uh, Isabel, um, I'm very sorry I couldn't hear the question. What is the number of the question? Maybe I can look for it in the chat box because I couldn't hear very well uh, what you said. Question two, but if anybody else would like to take the lead on answering that one in the meantime, um, please go ahead. Perhaps Clément on the engagement with civil society. Yeah, sure. Should I go ahead or? Yes, yes, please. And then Laurent, you can compliment once you uh, once you've been able to read it. 
Okay, so maybe briefly. Um, okay, so, over there, so yes, sorry. Oh, my camera, yeah. Uh, so briefly on, on civil society involvement. So I mentioned this drafting committee and uh, Haitian civil society were uh, were present. Uh, so when I'm saying civil society, I'm talking about private private sector, trade union, uh, but as well some uh, local organizations. Um, and maybe a second part of, of the response. Uh, so we had the first draft of the policy, and uh, and we did some regional consultation. Uh, so for us, it's key to, to consult local actors. And again, in this local consultation process, um, civil society was uh, highly involved uh, in uh, in the policy in the policy making exercise. Uh, maybe as well uh, within the policy, um, we identify some institutional arrangements to make for the setup of this policy and we suggest uh, to the government to create uh, a committee of civil society uh, that can follow up the uh, social protection initiatives. Um, so the involvement was, uh, was uh, I would say, was quite okay in the process, but we need to reinforce uh, this involvement. Yeah, and let me add, and sorry about that, I could ask the question. Let me add to that, that uh, involving the civil society give a sense of um, um, self-ownership. You know, they feel like um, they own the, 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 the process. So it was very important to, to involve them. And also they um, facilitated the, 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 the process. So their involvement was really capital for us. Thank you. Um, Marion, do you have anything to reflect on on the involvement of civil society in Mali? Okay, no, no, not that much. I mean, like, it is really difficult uh, to, to work on with uh, a local national NGO. It's not that they are, um, I mean, like, uh, it's not that they are good or not good. It's not the point. The point is that they are facing, uh, I mean, like, lots of pressure regarding uh, uh, the, I mean, like the local powers. And so sometimes it's easier to intervene in conflict areas with, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the international NGOs rather than in the local NGOs. But uh, well, up to that, I mean, like they all... consuming and they need human resources and it's costing and some donors don't want to pay for that uh, in their in their program. So it is a big challenge, but it's it worth it. Thank you, Marion. Thank you all. Um, I'm just going to try and provide some combined answers to questions six, seven, and eight. Um, so there was from Paul Crook working in Somalia, and he wanted to know more about the building blocks and understanding these better. Um, and for this, um, I refer you to the recording of the first webinar where, where the building blocks were presented by Nupur uh, Kreti um, from UNICEF um, and explaining what the opportunities are for humanitarians to link with them as part of preparedness, response and recovery. Um, there was uh, then a couple of questions uh, one from Ria and one from Marriott. Um, and those questions were about, um, they were about targeting uh, when you're linking with social protection systems and also about transfer values. And, you know, they've been touched on a little bit uh, in these presentations today and also in our, in our, our webinar on forced displacement, but we haven't gone into depth, um, but they will be subject of dedicated webinars uh, in future. So, um, please watch this space and if there are discussion threads on the topics please um, participate actively as we've been trying to say there is there are no stupid questions at all it's really about creating a dialogue at this stage um, so there are a couple of other questions that we haven't quite been able to to answer um, but uh, but we'll be sharing with them with the panelists and they'll be answered um, in writing after the webinar. Um, and we're also going to um, translate both the summary of the webinar and the Q&A into French because we're aware that Haiti and Mali are both French speaking contexts and it'd be helpful for these resources to be available to a wider audience. Um, so we'll wrap up the Q&A there. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to say a huge thank you to, um, uh, to our speakers for presenting extremely complex contexts um, in clear ways, 
linking to the frameworks that we um, that we'd articulated and and really addressing the questions that we posed to them um, and and certainly giving us a reality check about what is feasible and in what time frames um, but also hopefully some some concrete ideas about what humanitarians can do um, and and how we can collaborate better to um, you know start start with coordination amongst ourselves um, to provide that better playing field for, for working with the government and with development donors, uh, development actors. Um, so, yeah, so look out for the summary and Q&A. Um, keep taking part in our ongoing uh, discussion threads. Um, we had one on funding and uh, financing, and it's still live. Please, please uh, get involved on the on the D group. It was a subject that many of you are interested in. Um, our next webinar is on the 12th of March, and this will um, build on some of the questions raised today because it will be specifically on conflict environments. So the, the title is Operating at the Nexus Between Humanitarian Assist Assistance and Social Protection in Conflict Settings um, yeah, on the 12th of March. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you to the team at socialprotection.org for all their support. Um, thank you to Zara and thank you again to all the panelists and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You, everyone. Bye. Thank you.